thank you all for for having me today. What I thought would make the most sense since I have spent really my entire career um, in on Wall Street and my entire career in equity research is sort of go through really the basics of you know what equity research is how it works, um, how um, the different components of research, meaning um, who is involved um, in terms of the level of of support I have in my team, the different opportunities here, and really what's involved kind of on a day-to-day basis in terms of of really creating a powerful and successful franchise. Mm. Um, Just a really quick background on myself. Um, I graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1989, um, worked in a political think tank for a couple of years, and then went on to get my MBA at Stern. And then really, you know, very quickly, I did a very brief stint in management consulting, but very quickly went to um, equity research um, and spent the last 25 years really doing media or at media related uh, research, um, first at Bear Stearns and then at JP Morgan when JP Morgan acquired Bear Stearns in 2008. I've known Tom um, for, for a very long time, most of my career, and he's been a wonderful mentor uh, to me. Um, and I agree with him. That's really how this business works is you, everybody has a, a different franchise and I'll get into it more specifically in a minute. You know, every analyst covers one segment of the market, one industry, and everybody does it a little bit differently. I'm gonna talk about how I do it and how it's structured, mm. um, but it's watching people, um, how they succeed and, and picking and choosing what you've seen from them and what works um, and trying to mold that together into your own strategies really is really how um, I think you become very successful. You're taking the best of, of your peers and, and obviously being very knowledgeable in what you do. Um, I was just going to say also, if, if anybody has any questions, you know, please use the chat function, uh, raise your hand or whatever it is, raise your hand and we'll call on you. I think that is, we do want to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, I don't want to sit here and lecture you guys. I want to hear your questions and try to um, give you the answers that you're looking for. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. If I can figure out how to use this correctly, you'd think after two years of, there we go. Okay. So just to start off with, um, I cover media, um, super fun sector, honestly. Um, and I cover really every kind of stock that really is sort of involved in media. There are exceptions. Uh, for example, I don't cover Netflix because the internet analyst grabbed that early and he has it. Um, I don't cover like cable, which might own media assets because the way the department or way, the way equity research is set up is you have a senior analyst for every sub, sub every segment of the market. So I, I cover media, there's a cable telecom analyst, there's an internet analyst. There's a healthcare analyst, you know, there's an insurance analyst, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so the department had kind of carves up the coverage and you come in um, and you have a sector or you grow up into a sector being a junior analyst and you're really responsible for that sector. So what does that mean? Um, here on this sheet here, as you can see on the slide two, I cover right now 33 stocks um, and I've listed them in sort of subset sectors here. Basically it's entertainment, it's ad agencies, which are sort of marketing or media related, uh, cinema, live entertainment, video games we picked up a few years ago because it's become such a part of entertainment and outdoor companies, which is really billboards and stuff. Um, the way, um, again, a, a sector can be sort of carved up and changed depending on how the department head defines it. It, the, the stock coverage is fluid. And what I mean by that is, you know, I don't only cover these 33 stocks for 30, 25 years. I've been doing this for 25 years and this list has changed over the 25 years because things in industry change, right? I mean, video games, you know, really didn't exist in the way they exist now 25 years ago. Same thing for pretty much every company on this page. So it morphs is what I'm trying to say. And then beyond that, there are companies that grow and become more important, like Roblox. You know, that is something we felt was necessary to cover. Didn't really exist, a few, you know, several years ago. Um, and now it's a really big, powerful name. So we cover it and companies become less relevant too. And we may choose to drop them and not cover them. Um, also, there are IPOs, there are companies that go public that JP Morgan may or may not be involved in. And we would then naturally, you know, cover that as well, because if, if um, I'll get into this later, but if the investment bank side of a bank does a deal, it is sort of an, an you know, a, I guess it's sort of it is a spoken rule. It's, it's just sort of under, an understanding that the research side will then pick up coverage of the stock. Let me just explain real quickly what coverage means. Coverage means that 
I uh, officially have a rating on that stock. I'm responsible for that stock for the bank, which means that if an institutional investor, Fidelity, Putnam, someone who manages money um, has a question about that stock or wants to learn more about that stock, they then you know, look to me, Alexia, the research analyst, or my team or my written research to find out about that stock. And we'll go into how the communication works in a little bit. I do want to highlight, I'm going to get into this on the next page. I myself directly am not the lead analyst in all 33 of these stocks because over time, I have a team and I'll go into that in a minute, but over time, as my team gets more senior and proves themselves, um, they actually, I give them the opportunity to cover one of the stock or a couple stocks on their own. Again, trying to, you know, develop them over time into a senior analyst. So some of these smaller names, for example, Curiosity Stream and Fubo, one of my a vice presidents on my team recently picked up and she's sort of cutting her teeth with them. You tend to do that with the smaller stocks. Like I would, I would give Disney, who's, which is one of the biggest stocks I cover to a junior analyst, because obviously you want them to start off small and kind of learn that way. And then eventually have the opportunity to, um, to cover stocks on their own. I do want to point out that I think you're hearing from Tim Nolan. Is it tomorrow? I think it's tomorrow. He's, he was my junior um, many years ago. He's an amazing analyst now. Um, but this, uh, my point of saying that is, you know, you can come in as somebody's junior, learn from them, support a senior analyst, and then go break out and, and you know, have your own career and be your own senior analyst. Um, it's a great train. I think it's a great training ground. Um, I did that myself. I left my junior, my senior at Smith Barney year, God, years ago um, and became my own analyst. And, um, and uh, Tim Nolan has done, has had a great career as well. And he's done the same thing. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide. Hold on. All right. Hold on. Let me get back. I think I skipped one. Okay. Um, equity research overview. Let me just touch on the team because I think it's important to understand the roles that are involved in equity research. Um, there typically is, you know, every senior analyst typically has anywhere from, I'd say, one to four um, supporting team members. It could be someone right out of college, which is an analyst. It could be someone who either came right out of college and then worked for a few years, and they can be an associate or it can be a vice president. We, all, we hire either um, a, 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 a students right out of college or we hire MBAs. I would say that the trend in the industry has been to lean more into hiring students right out of college. Um, I just I just think the the value, at least from equity research point of view, placed on the MBA is is a little I think maybe less emphasized today than it was years ago. Both are valuable. We look at both, but I would say we tend to skew more with younger analysts out of college at this point, um, a little bit more so than the MBA grads, but both both obviously get opportunities. In terms of how this team is structured, so you have the analyst right out of college, you have the associate who could have a few years experience, the vice president is typically someone who's moved up within the, in the role and, um, and can eventually start taking their own coverage. And then of course, there's the senior analyst. Um, in terms of what you do in those roles, the analyst really will do the basic stuff. They will build the model. They'll start doing the research for the report. They'll follow industry data. They'll send me the, the important news every morning in terms of what news is impacting the industry or the stocks we cover. Um, and then as you move up, it, it's, it's sort of natural. You'll write more reports on your own. You'll build more complex models. You'll do some valuation analysis. You'll actually talk to the management teams and, and investors. And then as a vice president, like I mentioned, you can do more of the same more, in a more sophisticated manner. You can also start covering some of your own stocks if that's what your analysts, you know, some analysts don't believe in that. Some do. I always do. Um, so, um, so my vice presidents, the, the two that I have on my team, I have two vice presidents and, and uh, an analyst, they, the two vice presidents both cover their own stocks. Um, let me go to the next slide. All right. Um, okay, here we go. Product lines. Uh, types of research. Now, let me just take a step back um, and then I want to jump into what we do actually write and walk up through these reports. But the whole, the whole point of equity research, right, is to be the expert on these stocks and have an, a one, an incredible brand and recognition so that if anybody 
right? Whether a big investor, a hedge fund, a small investor, if anybody who's a client of the firm who pays JP Morgan in this case has a question or wants to know what you know to do with a the stock, they think to come to Alexia for media. Um, to give you a perspective of the landscape, I have approximately 30 competitors. So there, um, there's 30 other people roughly, um, whether it's Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, or smaller boutique um, sell-side firms, we call them sell-side if you're if you are on the, doing after research the role I do, that do what I do. Um, so it's important to A, do a very thorough job, and two, um, create a good brand or reputation because you want somebody who, who wants information on the stock to always think of you first. So it's sort of like, you're the, you know, be the best in the industry. Doesn't mean you'll talk to everybody, but you you definitely don't want to be number 15 or 16 or 17 because the odds are you're not going to get the calls from the, the important banks. So the most important thing is to have an incredible brand, an incredible franchise, incredible reputation. How you get there, there's a few ways. You have to have the top models, the top financial analysis, and you have to write really strong research reports because if you publish strong reports, you know, you have something, good, good analysis, good research, you have something to talk about. And when you have something to talk about, you get recognition for your stock call, for your for whatever you're talking about, you get recognition for the work you've done. The more recognition you get for the work you've done, the more you build your brand. So it's sort of, it's sort of, there, there's pieces to the puzzle, there's financial analysis, there's written research, and then there's sort of the marketing branding of the product. And as you can imagine, the younger people on the, uh, in the group, We'll do a bit more of the legwork, the, the the financial modeling, the written work, and I'm really the face of the team, the marketing, um, uh, the marketing person, the, the one with the brand. Doesn't mean I'm not modeling. Doesn't mean I'm not editing or writing research notes. I'm doing all of that. But I think the more senior you get, the more you're about conveying your position, conveying your investment thesis, conveying your knowledge and less about the day-to-day -day work. Now, having said all that, I want to get back to the, to the type of research reports we write. Now, there, there are several kinds of research reports we write because the point is we want to, again, be the point person for any stock. So if there is breaking news on Disney, people, people want people to pick up the phone and call Alexia, people to email Alexia. You know, it always has to be Alexia associated with the big media stocks. And if we have regular written research that's always in front of them in their inbox and in their email, they always know we're on top of the story. So what is the type of research we write? Well, there's first thing we write, and I'm gonna give you an example of this in the next few slides, but I'll review them here quickly. Uh, we write initiation reports. So when we are launching coverage or starting coverage on a stock, a new stock, um, and I think I use, let me look here, I use Roblox as an example. Let me jump to here and I'll go back. When we're launching coverage of a new stock, we picked up Roblox a year ago, which means we basically decided this was not associated with the banking deal. So it was our choice to cover it. It wasn't something that we were sort of, was, you know, I had to do in that sense. When we launched coverage on Roblox, we basically thought this is a big stock, a lot of invest in terms of market cap, a lot of investors are asking about it. Um, and we want to cover it to sort of help build our franchise. And we were also, we we're expanding more into the video game area of our coverage. And we thought this was a key player in, in the gaming and um, we, we wanted to, to have it under coverage. So what we did is we basically went out, we met with management. Uh, I think it was during COVID, so it might've been virtual, I can't remember. We studied, we read it in the industry, studied about it. We built a financial model, met with management again, um, and then formulate an opinion on what we think about the stock. And you can see here it's overweight rated. Um, so we actually have a positive view on the outlook for the stock. Now in an initiation report, we basically come up with a rating, which is simply put buy, hold, or sell, but we call them overweight, neutral, and underweight at JP Morgan. Um, and then we write our investment thesis you know, it should tell you the name, the, the beginning, the, the name, the ticker, the market caps, basic information, and why we like the stock. It has to be short and to the point. People read so much. Everybody's got ADD. And you've got to kind of get to the point across as quick and as as focused as possible. So that's you get a lot just from the. This is the. I think this report is probably. I'm guessing. I can't remember. Thirty pages. Forty pages. 20 pages, something like that, but you want people to read the first two pages and know exactly what you're saying. And then they could go to the rest of the report if they're interested in going further. Um, so on the first page, we'll put, you know, what we like about the stock, important information about the stock. 
And then you can see here, you know, the next couple of paragraphs, some key considerations to support our investment thesis, you know, going into a bit more detail why we like the stock. And the last paragraph always has a bit on the front page, which is valuation. How is this stock valued versus, you know, what we think their competitors or their, or their peer group is? And we and why it should trade either higher or lower than their peer group, you know, because it grows faster, has more opportunity, whatever it is. Um, so this was again, this is um, an example of an initiation report um, that we put out last year. Uh, okay, let's go back a minute. Okay, other reports we have primers or sort of thematic reports. Uh, it's funny that it's, uh, um, Tom probably remembers the Ad 101 because I've been putting it out for about 20 years, but people still read it. So what they what our primers are, um, they are intro to kind of a kind of a, a book with a shelf life. I'll put it that way. Um, our Ad 101 is a great example. Um, we have one on the video gaming industry when we launch. It's sort of an introduction. You know, the 101 sort of you know says so in the name into what you know, into a sector, into a theme, into an area um, to kind of give somebody who's newer to this, to the, um, to the industry, a good kind of overview. So the reason we keep doing this every year and the reason it's so important and so valuable is, as you can imagine, people, investors change all the time, right? So whoever, you know, maybe owns, I don't know, Omnicom, which is an ad agency at Fidelity, you know, he might, Fidelity's notorious for changing, um, the roles. So uh, the guy that covers the ad agencies at Fidelity this year could be different than the guy that covered it last year. So the new guy coming into Fidelity may like know nothing about the ad market and will look for a primer or some thematic report to kind of teach them in terms of what are the key data points to look to? How can I learn about this? What are the stocks involved in it? So that's why we write these primers or thematic reports, because I think they're very valuable, particularly to new people in the, on the buy side and investors. Then we also try to keep them fresh. So in the Ad 101, for example, the first five pages is an executive summary of the current trends. So even folks that you know may have read it before will still want to look to it to see the update in terms of what my current thought is, you know, looking into this coming year on whatever the theme is that we're writing the report about. So let me give you a quick look of what um, the primer looks like. Um, this is it. This is the Ad 101 here on page six. Um, you can see here succinct bullets sort of trying to summarize the theme of reports. Um, it'll sort of expand on it a bit in the second and the second or third bullet. Um, there'll be you have to always bring stuff back, I think, to a stock because nobody and that's why we talk about relevant stocks here in a later bullet. Nobody. I mean, there's some people that want to read on Wall Street just for because they're interested in an area, in an area, but generally it has to come back to a stock. Because if you're wanting to learn something, you're going to ask the question ultimately, like, well, how am I going to invest with this knowledge? So we try to tie everything, even these thematic pieces, back to back to a stock. And then, like I mentioned before, always in the first page, we want to end it with kind of the thematic takeaways or the sort of key points. Everything really, all the summary has to be on the first page. And then this is a, I know this is a 120 page report because it's a bigger primer, um, but then if they feel like they want to go in and look in and learn more, you've got the whole report to kind of refer back to. Um, so those are primers. And I'd say we put out two or three a year, different topics, obviously, um, and their annual pieces. Then there's sort of monthly or sort of periodic, I'd say sort of reports. These are more thematic. Let me give you an example. The streaming wars, right? I cover, except for Netflix, I cover all the, the streaming video on demand uh, businesses. So we all the media companies, you know, Viacom CBS is Paramount Plus, um, Discovery Warner has, you know, HBO, Max, you know, obviously Disney is Disney Plus. So because those are so much of focus by the investment community. But also the big area of investment and growth for all the media companies, we spend a lot of time on it. I'm not just talking about watching the shows. We do do that and we talk about it in our group meetings. But we also spend a lot of time on, um, you know, how many subscribers are they adding? What's the ARPU? Um, how quickly can they grow? How much are they investing? And investors always want to hear about it. We even had a podcast on it for a while. So we put out monthly reports in terms of the streaming wars. Who's winning? Who's losing? meaning who's, you know, what's really kind of what's going on. Uh, it's called, we have a report called the DTC Roundup, kind of the, the big hits, like when, 
I don't know, Emily in Paris came out, I would say on Netflix, even though we don't cover, we talk about Netflix, we have to, it's relevant. Um, you know, when, when something like that came out, we talk about is Netflix gonna gain subscribers? Um, what does this mean to some others? Um, I'm noticing here there's chats. So let me just finish my thought, then we'll go into the questions. So there's um there's always something to talk about. And I investors love it because they want to make sure that on a regular basis, like in a monthly way, they're up to speed on trends, which will ultimately impact their investments or potential investments. Cause so the growth in streaming services is such a big data point right now for almost every media company. Cause again, that's the growth strategy longer term. All right, I'm gonna take a pause and look at this chat here. So, Alexia, most of that chat is, I've just been kind of, of Talk, commenting okay, so you're as, not as, 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 not, not questioning, um, letting people know uh, resources that Georgetown makes available Perfect. to get, emergent invest techs makes available. Although uh, Rena did ask, and, and it's actually a really good point, you know, do you have ESG component to your analysis and reports now? Obviously, ESG has become incredibly prominent. Yes, um, we do. We do have we do have ESG um, components. Well, we, let me put this: up. we have a ESG team at at, um, at JP Morgan, um, and we have um, ESG reports we can write or contribute to, and we have an ESG conference at JP Morgan. I would say surprisingly. We don't get a lot of questions. I say surprisingly because people often ask, you know, who, who, you know, who talks about ESG. I would say on an analyst-specific level, and maybe there's some industries where it's more relevant, right? If we had a tobacco analyst, which we don't have, it'd be very relevant. But surprisingly, as a media analyst, I don't get a lot of questions on it. Um, but I know J.P. Morgan is making a bigger effort in it, and I know we have this big conference coming up because Disney is speaking at it. Um, so I think it will become much more prominent and probably embedded in more of our research, I would say, going forward. Um, just going back to here, I would say, uh, jumping to next, um, actually, let me show you if I think I have an example of a, of a monthly. Yes, this is just the example of our monthly, the DTC Roundup. So this just, it's actually a really fun piece if you like, you know, streaming um, uh, platforms and learning kind of what's where you can see here, we talk about 1883, which was the prequel to Yellowstone that Viacom launched um, and how it really is helping their platform Paramount Plus because they sold Yellowstone to Peacock so they don't have it on their own platform. We talk about what Netflix is doing. We talk what Apple's doing. Um, so it's, it's actually even as a consumer, I think it's a fun read. Um, but it's one of our more popular pieces right now because the I think the investors always want to make sure they know what is going on with the streaming platforms. Okay, so going back to here, company specific notes. This consists of, you know, again, like I started off saying, I am responsible for, you know, the 33 stocks that I listed. So if ever something is going on, I'll use Disney's, Disney's example, with Disney, I need to have an opinion on it. I need to have an opinion on how it's impact gonna impact the stock outlook. So um, because of rules of fair disclosure, we really can't tell you know, investor X something if it's material, unless we put it in a published report. So what does that mean is we're constantly writing reports. I, I wouldn't say daily, because there's not daily material information that's coming out on Disney. We are reporting, re writing reports daily, period, because we have 33 stocks, but we're not writing them daily. We're writing them often. I would say a, a stock as big as Disney, which is a few hundred billion market cap, we, we're definitely writing on them, I'd say at least once or twice a month. Um, so anything notable we want to put in print so that way we're, we're comfortable sharing it in public, you know, and, and to, to investors, to people outside of the firm. And that could be, you know, let's see, what did I use an example? I think that's earnings. Maybe I didn't put an example of a of a company specific note. Oh, there's different examples of them. So we will we will write a company specific note on breaking news. We will write a company specific note on changing earnings estimates. If we decided, you know, oh, we don't think they're gonna our estimates are in our model are not gonna are not close to where they're gonna come in. Um, we can we can basically update our model. And if we want to publish our model again, we have to write a note. So we could write a note on our changes in our estimates and why, why they changed, where they changed from, where they're going to and why they changed. And we can you know, write a note on breaking news. We can write a note on 
on update and earnings. As you guys know, companies report in this country four times a year, um, less than that in some other countries, but here four times a year. And we will, and that means we're updating our model when they report. We've talked to management when they report. We listened to their conference call. We looked at their queue and all that new data, you know, obviously drives us to update our estimates and update our thoughts on the company. So every time a company reports earnings, we always will write a note. So you can assume at minimum, and this is real minimum because we do more, we will write th on those 33 stocks four times a year. But you know, it's a lot more than that. And let me give you a quick idea what an earnings note looks like. Lionsgate, this is a film TV studio um, that also owns Stars. Um, here, we basically talk about, the headline has to be, what was our first impression? Um, what did the what did the earnings release? What did we learn? What was the biggest takeaway? In this in this case, the takeaway was you know the the results um, showed um, improvement in margins. But however, the important takeaway here is we are reducing our estimates going forward because they're spending more money in content. So you have to have sort of a headline so you get investors to actually read it. And so it has to sort of you can't just say updating our model or the company reported. You want to give the quick, real quick takeaway. So they want to kind of dig in and look further. So that's what that, that title is. And then we basically, we try to summarize the results less because anybody can look that up on the news, right? Or, or find it on a, in a filing, but try to take what they report and, and offer our opinion. So give them a little bit of information about what they reported, but more, more likely actually just sort of tell them what our opinion is and our interpretation and our analysis and what this new data in terms of their new earnings, what it means to us and our investment opinion. In this case, we have an overweight on the stock really because we think it's going to be taken out. Um, but you know what they do on a fundamental basis is still relevant. So we do write about it here. Um, okay. Alexia, there, there's a really good question in the, the chat. Uh, what was it like covering AMC at this time last year? What effect do you think the growing number of retail investors using platforms like Robinhood will have on the market moving forward? Right. Um, great, great question. Um, uh, for a very odd reason having to do with investment banking, a, we actually didn't cover AMC Entertainment. It often gets confused with AMC Networks. And actually, I'm glad you asked that because it's a very funny story. <laughs> um, there's two stocks. There's AMC Entertainment, which is a movie theater. Um, and there's AMC Networks, which is a cable network. If you think The Walking Dead, you guys are familiar with that. That was on AMC Net, Breaking Bad, AMC Network. So we cover AMC Network, and the ticker is just one letter different between AMC Entertainment, the movie theater, and AMC, AMC Network. And it is interesting. We had a sell on a We don't cover AMC Entertainment, the, the meme stock you're talking about, which had the huge, crazy ride thankfully, because it would have been very challenging to cover it because again, the movement in the stock was not based on anything fundamental. And it's it's really, and that's what we base our research on. We listen to market sentiment, we talk to people, but our research is based on fundamentals and to cover a stock that moves purely on speculation and sentiment would have been very, very challenging. So I'm grateful we can cover it. We don't cover it because there's some issue on the investment banking side. So we, and it's honestly, it wasn't a very big stock. So it wasn't missing in our coverage. But interesting enough, we do cover AMC Networks, which is the cable network. And so many retail investors actually confuse the two, which you think someone who's putting money to work actually would, would find out the appropriate ticker, but they didn't. And so AMC Networks, which we had a sell on because we're not very bullish on cable networks, um, went up enormously. It doubled and it was 100% because people confused the two stocks. Uh, eventually it came back down, but it, it, was very, it was very odd to see that. But I think that's indicative of the insanity that was going on at the time with these meme stocks and the fact that you just had this un irrational um, investment, you know, based on, on rumor and, 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 your, and the retail investment community rather than fundamentals. Um, hmm. So that, that's my little story on AMC, but unfortunately not on AMC Entertainment, which because we don't cover it. Um, okay, going back, where were we? Um, okay, alerts. I do want to talk about alerts. Um, alert, you know, we, there's a lot of restrictions in equity research to try to keep it fair. Um, a lot of these changes happened about 20 years ago, and there's some regulations naturally about what we can and can't do. And, and like I mentioned too, we can't talk about a new 
material piece of information unless we publish it first. Um, so what we can do to kind of get things moving faster is we can write alerts. And this is basically a shorter note that requires less of the components that I showed you in the other note. You don't have to put your model in it. You don't have to put, talk about your price target. You don't talk about your earnings. It's just a quick opinion. And so I actually put the athletic in your times in here, but I think one that's more interesting that I will talk to is when it was announced or, or I don't know, even not, yeah, I guess when it was announced that Microsoft was gonna buy, was gonna try to buy Activision. We cover Activision, we don't cover Microsoft. Another analyst covers Microsoft. <clears throat> I thought it was important to right away put out a note and tell investors, you know, what our thoughts are. So what would be relevant for the investment community? Because we wouldn't want to just copy the press release, right? I bet they're going to buy Activision. So what was relevant is we wrote a quick alert within an hour of the news breaking. And we talked about what is the likelihood of the deal going through? Because if what was interesting at the time, the stock opened close to the takeout price and then end up trading during the day kind of at a huge discount to where it was being taken out. Obviously indicating, we talked to our risk arb desk and got more information indicating that there was a lot of skepticism that the DOJ will approve this deal so it may not go through. So we talked about what our thoughts were, the deal going through, why it may, why it might not. And then the, the other thing that was important to do is to address what does this mean to other stocks in the universe? Because the first thing investors will think, oh, Activision is already up. I missed it. Microsoft's buying it. Now what? They'll, they'll think next, okay, well, can another video game company be taken out and who's going to buy it? So you want to take it one step further. So in the note, we also addressed, you know, will, what other stocks could be bought in this space and why? And in there, we specifically talked about electronic arts. Um, they, they, have, they have FIFA and a bunch of of other games, I'm sure some of you will know, and whether or not that was a takeout candidate and why not. So that a quick alert is a quick reaction to some breaking news to get your thoughts out there. And it's very efficient because all of a sudden you're, you're addressing, you know what the top three questions the investors are gonna ask. You're putting it on a note, the notes available to all the clients. It's a very quick way of sort of getting your messaging out um, automatically. And the last thing, which is probably the least relevant or at least interesting of our notes is really industry conference notes. And this is, let's say if one a company speaks at a conference, not everybody attended the webcast or went to the conference when it was in person. So you wanna write a recap of what the management team said at our conference. Um, well, so Alexia, if I can sort of just chime yeah. in, there, there's two things. First of all, uh, James asked, did you cover the Wordle acquisition by the New York Times yesterday, uh, which was, which, by the way, low seven figures. I don't know what low seven figures yeah. meant. Uh, uh, we could discuss the valuation, there, yeah. but but uh, Guillermo asked, uh, and, and this fits with the industry conference and also you were talking about AMC uh, and something that academics are always concerned about. Are there any conflicts of interest between equity research and other divisions in the firm, right? The Famously, the idea of the Chinese wall, which is you're not supposed to be talking to the investment banking side, uh, and there was then a big push towards independent investment mm -hmm. uh, analysis, analysts. So you wouldn't have this sort of conflict. But Guillermo uh, was saying, do you, are there conflicts of interest? Do you see it in the industry? How might you deal with this? How might our students deal with this? You know, if they take a job on the sell side. Great, great question. On the first one, real quick on the wordle, too small. I mean, yes, yes, covered it. Yes, looked at it, didn't write on it. Because again, my concern is New York Times and it's, it just, you know, it just wasn't material enough to warrant writing. And it's, it's not going to impact our investment opinion and probably would impact our estimates. So at this point, if we get more information from New York Times when they report next week, we will update our model, maybe discuss it in the note. But at this point, a little too small. We're not going to write on stuff that's not material, um, but good question. And the second question, great question there, which is conflict of interest. <laughs> it's... um. It's a, it's a, it, it is a, a very important question because I think it's something an analyst works with constantly. And the rules when I started this job 25 years ago and the rules today are very different. Um, I would say the wall is a lot higher and there's a lot more watchdogs on it. Today, um, there's so much regulation. There's so many watchdogs. It, you have a lot less conflict in the end of the day. You have a company that goes public and um, the bankers obviously supportive of it. They're getting fees. You have a hundred percent independence. I'm not just saying this. You have a hundred percent independence to write whatever rating you want and whatever research you want. 
really with with minimal to net no pushback. Now, let me just give you a caveat. If we're working on the if we're if we're working with lawyers on the deal, which we are, lawyers and bankers on the deal, the lawyers are always on the phone. We are constantly helping them with evaluation range. And I'm going to get into our role in banking in a minute. We're constantly helping them with evaluation range. We're constantly helping them formulate the deal. There's a lot of investment banking work associated, at least with media, not every sector. Um, and we're always working with banking. So it is very unlikely that you have an absolute hatred or really dislike or see really big red flags on a deal that you have to cover. And I'm saying this because we have to go, to, the analysts will go to commitment committee before the deal gets approved. So you have plenty of times to voice your opinions. So is it possible that a stock comes out that you've taken public as a bank and the research analyst puts a sell on it? Yes, it is possible. And you can do that without, without any negative ramifications. It's, it's totally fine to, in today's day and age. It just doesn't happen that often because the only reason it would happen is if the stock really rallied and the valuation was at a point where you no longer felt comfortable recommending it. Because if you found something fundamentally wrong with the company, you did have, the bankers didn't have to listen to you, but you did have plenty of times during the process to voice that. So it would be less likely the company would have proceeded with the IPO, at least in that valuation range, if you had raised that many red flags. I hope that makes sense and answers your question. Um, I will get into the banking relationship because I actually think it's very interesting to take if you're thinking about going investment banking. Okay, let me move on because um, away from this written report. All right, go through all these. Okay, the research, I'll just do this briefly because I don't want to, I do think we want to talk about banking for a bit, but let me just go through this briefly. The research process. Um, you, um, in order to initiate coverage on a stock, you obviously pick a rating, um, you do um, you build a model, you have financial projections, and then you basically write a report walking through you know, what the company does, but more importantly, the, your investment thesis, what you like about the company and what you don't like about it, um, you know, risk, basically investment positive, investment concerns, and then you have a good section on how you value the stock and how you... Um, and, your, and in, where, how you come up with your estimates. It's, it's pretty basic in that sense. You could give some industry information when we launched on video games. We hope we put a big report out on the industry um, and Fortnite was very topical then. We talked about Fortnite, even though it was not a public company because it was relevant to the stocks. But basically you just write a, a report on the company and then talk about your outlook on the stock. Once you put the, you, you have to go through a committee in the department it's, it's not a big deal. It's your department head, you know, usually a lawyer, um, and you sort of present your ideas. The more senior you are, the less pushback you are. For the more junior people, they'll kind of try to nitpick on the report and try to get you, make sure you know what you're talking about. But they approve it. You publish it. The morning you publish it, you go on the morning call. Very briefly, the morning call is basically where the analysts will go and now it's in Zoom, but back then it was in person. You'll go speak in front of the sales force and you'll basically tell them in three minutes or less, because there's a lot of people that speak and they want to you to be to the point, you know, what, you know, what you're trying to convey, you know, and you you won't just go on the morning call with an with a um initiation piece. You can go when you want to reiterate your you want you just when you want to get notice from the sales force. We have an interesting note coming out, you want to change your rating, you have a big call on a stock, mm -hmm. you will go and speak to the sales force for two to three minutes mm -hmm. and tell them your, your quick summary of your ideas. So you do that when you initiate with a stock and then you follow up on the phone all day with, with the investors um, and with the sales force and you basically try to market your call of the, of, on the new report. Alexi, if I can kind of throw in a couple of chat questions here that, that came in. Ryan asked, and I think this is great, what are the most common writing or research mistakes or omissions you see young analysts make? All right. Uh, obviously, it takes time to learn the, the, the learn that. And then uh, the other thing about that is Christian is asking about when you analyze companies, whether it's the young analyst or you're doing it now, do you rely solely on the metrics given by management or do you rely on third party data sources? Oh, so. two, two very good questions. Um, the first one, common mistakes. Hopefully they're caught before it gets published because to if it's a meaningful enough mistake and you have to publish a retraction, it's a little embarrassing. It happens. 
not the end of the world, but it happens just because it's on the news wires and everything, you got to retract it. But there's so many checkpoints because, you know, you write a report, you don't just press send, it goes to a whole uh, compliance approval team who then checks with the other sides of the bank. Is it okay that you write this? They check for a language that's not appropriate, you know, so there's, there's checkpoints. It's like you've got a few proofreaders along the way. So the odds are of you putting something out that was either inappropriate or, or not allowed slim to none. Um, so the mistakes that go out that aren't caught by these people would be mistakes in your model, where you said the wrong thing. Like if I didn't proofread and I had a junior person who didn't do a great job, maybe they said we're raising our estimates when we're lowering our estimates, you know, things like that would be more likely to go out that you would, again, I think it's rare if you've been doing this for a while because you know what to look for, but it happens. I, it, I've done it. I've made a mistake. Again, not often, but I've made them. Um, but it's something like that. It's not going to be something that has a legal nature, a regulatory nature to it because you have checkpoints that watch it before it go out. On the on the second question, oh my God, I just blanked what it was. It was the, like, uh, it's the metrics, right? Do you just rely on, on, yes, on management yes. or do you have third-party services? Like, yeah, yeah, no, great question. 100% don't rely on management. We <laughs> talk to management all the time because First of all, when you're on a phone with a client, you say, I just spoke with management. They always like pay attention and listen. So it's always good to be in the flow. And we talk to management all the time because you don't, to your earlier question, you don't want to ever be wrong, or at least you, you want to try not to be wrong as often as possible. So bouncing thoughts or ideas off of them, you can't come and say, we're going to change our numbers or we're going to change our rating. That's not allowed. But you can say, you know, I heard, you know, the third party data, we buy a lot of third party data, particularly on the video game side, on the mobile side, to see how what downloads are looking like, um, to get a sense like you know, New, York, New York Times as, as an idea, or, or Activision, you know, what Call of Duty download, who, who's who's actually buying Call of Duty, how much time is spent online. We look at the Twitter feeds and seeing how people are, you know, talking about it or watching it. Um, so a lot of third party data because it's more valuable, um, because it's independent, um, much better source than just talking to management. But I will say, you know, it, if we see something notable on the third party data, I would more likely than not pick up the phone and well, Activision, the video game companies really don't tell you much, but like New York Times, I pick up the phone, I'm saying the third party data is showing that the subscription growth in the quarter really is slowed down in, in November, December. You know, have you seen that? What do you think? They may not comment on it, but they could highlight, oh, you know what? That's because of X, Y, and Z. And all of a sudden you've learned something to kind of add to the third-party data. So the answer is a combination, but you don't want to be a parrot for the company, right? You're not their PR agency. So absolutely do independent research. In the context of that, Will had asked a question that I had to go back for, which is how do you measure your progress or performance? When I teach valuation, right, we talk about modeling, right? You're predicting the future. You know this better than anybody, Alexa. It is really difficult to predict the future, even if you have the model, right? Things happen. And so the question is, especially in a fragmented space with like 30 competitors, do you strive to be right in hindsight, or is it your goal to ensure you have fundamental analysis to back up your positioning, regardless of what happens with the stock? And so I guess I'll rephrase Will's question to, is it okay to basically have good analysis and end up being wrong because things went, went a different direction. I, it's funny. I have a junior who is taking on a more senior role and um, I, he's, he's excellent. And he's always trying to be, wants to make sure he's right and do the right thing um, and get it perfect. And I constantly tell him, and, and, and Tom will remember Dana, Dana Telsey, this, this retail analyst that, that was, she, again, every analyst does things differently. She was so great with branding and marketing. And, and she, I learned this from her many, many years ago. I constantly tell him it's always better to be visible and out there than always being right. Now, having said that, of course, you want to always be right. And you don't want to necessarily, um, you know, you don't want to go out there if you think you're wrong. I'm not saying that. But it's better to make the call than not make the call to make sure that you are 100% right and perfect. You know, get out there, be visible. You're not the you're not the person responsible 
you're not the buy side, right? The, the, the PM, the analyst, the hedge fund manager, whoever it is on the investor side, he's responsible for the buy the stock. What your goal is to make sure that he listens to you and looks to you and wants to read your research more than anybody else and talk to you when he's trying to develop an opinion about whether or not to buy the stock. Um, the other point of your question was, how much do you sort of, I think you said go with the fundamental analysis versus kind of go with what you think. I, I mean, I guess at my level, because I've been doing this for so long, some of it is gut feel. Some of it is sort of, oh, this is where the market, I look at the market trends. I look where people are buying, selling. I, you just sort of learn over time to kind of interpret data and know which ones are more important than others. But you always want to do some analysis, right? You can't just sort of say, oh, I think Netflix is going up because I really like that show. You have to kind of put the pieces together. Okay, you know, they have this, you know, Squid Game, you know, is is is, is how many, you got, you got to sort of take it to the next step. Like how many subscribers, who's watching that didn't have it before? What's the demographic? Would they have subscribed already? You have to kind of take a step back and do some analysis. Otherwise, you're probably more likely to be, you know, you're not as, you're not going to be as sure of your call than if you, if you didn't do that. You can choose not to answer this because I know you want to get to the banking part, but uh, a, a big part of academic research talks about like herding among analysts um, that, that could be on the buy side, right? The, the, I, the idea being it's okay to be wrong as, as long as you're not wrong alone, right? The <laughs> idea is if you're in the group and wrong, you could say everybody else missed it too. Uh, so, do you look at other analysts? Do you look at what your competitors are doing? Uh, does that come into play at all? If you've if you've got something very different than what the let's say the the rest of the street saying? Yes and no. Yeah, yes and no. Absolutely. Um, there is first call consensus. I mean, you touch on it in your classes where you know there is the the average. They have people's major estimates. It's revenue, EBITDA, EPS published. Um, and then there's an average um, out there. And if you're, it's important to know what it is and look at it only because not that you want to you know, be with the crowd and kind of, you know, do what the herd is doing, but more that if you're not doing that, you need to know why, right? If someone says, well, your estimate is 50 cents and the streets at, you know, 35, you have to answer the question, like, why are you 15 cents above consensus? Mm -hmm. So it, it is important to know what your peers are doing to that sense, because you need to have a reason that you're so different. And it could be a great reason. Maybe you have insight, maybe you have a real conviction, but maybe you're just off. <laughs> Therefore, you might want to go back and look at your model again. So yeah, we, we don't necessarily try to change our opinion to, to go along with consensus. I don't think that really adds value, but we definitely want to be aware of what consensus is. Thank you. Lexi, you have four more slides to go and, and time okay. is going through. Let so. me keep going. Let me keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't think we need to spend too much time here. This is just what happens with earnings. It's a big part of the job, which is um, earnings will come out four times a year in this country, um, either before the market close. Um, I was actually showing my son the slide earlier and he's like, why does it, why can't it come out during the day? And I was explaining, you know, if you're going to release important news, you're going to have it before the market opens or after it closed. You don't want to release it during the market because it creates too much volatility and the, frankly, no one has time to digest it. Then it's followed by an earnings call, which means that senior management will host a call and discuss the results and then it, then you basically you know get on the phone and have if you're if you're maybe analyst 29 in the industry is not going to speak directly with management after earnings call but the top 10 analysts in the industry will will have a conversation one-on-one -on -one conversation with the management teams um, and then obviously the most important thing is to write up your thoughts quickly and get on the phone with clients so that's what happens it's so usually it's the time of of the year that my team and I work really long hours. The rest of the year is not so bad. Um, okay, the next slide is, I think, can you, am I, I skip one? I don't think so. Communication um, with the buy side. This is important. I remember years ago when I was probably most of your age, like just, just coming out of college and thinking about my career, maybe a little older than that, coming out of my MBA, I met with somebody on the sell side. He was a radio analyst. So this is how long ago it was because radio was a huge sector. Now it doesn't exist um, as a sector. Um, and I asked him, you know, what it takes to be a good equity research analyst. And he said, you have to be a marketer. 
You got to be a marketer. It's not about the analysis. It's not about the writing. It's about marketing. And you know what? There's some truth to what he said. Um, you have to be personable to a certain degree. You have to want to talk to people a lot. You have to want to share your ideas. If you have, if you uncovered something, you have the best research in the world and you're not good at communicating that research, it's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. So if you, I mean, again, if you want to come in as a junior and just do models and write research reports, that's amazing. But if you want to eventually be an equity research analyst, you have to like to market. You have to like to talk to people. I love to market. I loved getting on the road, going to Boston, you know, seeing my, at this point, their old friends and just sort of chatting with them about what I think about my stocks. And again, we don't talk about all 33. They pick the ones they're interested in. Those the ones you talk about, or you just talk about the big ones. Um, it's, you know, you go to Europe, you go to Asia sometimes, you go to the big cities in the U.S., or you just would during COVID do Zoom calls and stay on the phone, but you're constantly sort of just staying in connection with your counterpart on the buy side. So again, you have a relationship with them and they know to come to you and not the guy at Morgan Stanley. I mean, they'll probably go to the guy at Morgan Stanley. He's good too, but you know what I mean? You're, you're in the flow for sure. Okay. These and Alexia, just one thing, this is on the sell side, right? We're going to hear from somebody on the buy side in research and they have a different tech. 100%. I think everything I'm saying on the sell side, to Tom's point, a lot, some of it is overlap, the analysis, the, the modeling, but in terms of the banking relationship, the marketing, all that specific to the sell side. Um, basic skill sets for the job. I thought it was important just to talk about this because we're always hiring people. We're, you know, the team's looking for two um, analysts right now. There's just, you know, they're just out because we're expanding our coverage and we lost somebody to the buy side. Um, the, uh, what people ask, what do you usually look for? So what I think makes a good junior person coming into this role, financial analysis. So taking great courses, you know, in the MSB, um, here, really understanding basic financial analysis, know how to build a financial model. There'll be, there's always trainings. So you don't know perf perfectly, but you have to have, you have to know how to read a 10 K a 10 Q, you know, what the basic drivers of a model are, you know, really understanding, um, financial financial models and financial statement analysis. Um, industry knowledge, that usually comes, you don't necessarily walk in the door with it, but you know, learn the key themes in the industry, the trends that shape it, the data points, the data sources, and develop relationships over time with people in the industry that can help you. Um, I often speak at conferences and on panels just because you, you, it gives you uh, a bit more of a presence and not on the investor side, but in the industry. So then if I, someone knows who I am, then I need to can call somebody and ask them for information, like in a private company, they'll do that because they've seen me at a conference, they know who I am. Strong writing skills. I think this can be learned. I think if you went through Georgetown, you're probably a good writer. Um, but you know, it, the point, the point with writing is to be able to convey a very clear message to the point, right? Don't go on and on and on. They get to the point of why this is an investment thesis. And then, like I mentioned before, marketing and branding skills are important. Um, last um, thing on marketing, you the marketing is internal. This is again, sell side to Tom's point. You talking to the sales, the traders in, within the firm, speaking on the morning call, talking to clients, in-person meetings, and then industry conferences. You can go on, JP Morgan has sort of indifferent about TV. I like to go on CNBC, so I'm on it um, from time to time totally, uh, they don't have a strong pre preference one way or the other if you want to be on the on TV. Last slide, I think, is the collaboration, other areas of the bank. This is specific to the sell side too. Um, talking to sales and trading, you want your traders and, the, and your salespeople to know what you're saying because the more people that know what you're saying in JP Morgan, the more people can convey your message outside of JP Morgan. So make sure the people inside, so that means talking to the sales piece, people talking to the traders. Investment banking. We touched on this a bit in the Q&A, but um, do working on IPOs, talking to bankers with a lawyer on the line, just about industry trends, making sure they're smart. All of this is super helpful um, and a big part of the job. You, you are involved in IPOs. You are involved in roadshows. You're involved in marketing the deals. Um, again, it's all with certain regulations, but you know, if, if it's an industry that is active in the in the in the IPO market, you're gonna you're gonna be very involved in them. Um, so so basically, it is, it is a good chunk, especially in this market. I'd say I worked on 11 deals last year, 
and have several active deals right now. And then last thing, I don't know why I threw this on there, but mentorship, I think it's important to just, you know, you know, there's a lot of stuff JP Morgan likes you to work with, with other areas of the bank, you know, mentor younger folks. I do a lot of that um, probably because I've just been doing this for a long time. So I'll, I'll, I think that's it. Sorry if I've gone on for a long time. Um, I'm happy to answer. I would just, let me give a little two second promo. I absolutely love my job. I think equity research is a phenomenal career. Um, I just think you, you sort of end up being your own boss in the sense you have your own little business. You decide when you want to write reports, not, not earnings. Um, and it's just a, it's a wonderful mix of, you know, financial analysis, writing, learning about an industry, talking to people. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a great job and I would recommend it to everybody um, who's interested in those and has those skill sets or interested in developing those skill sets. It also gives you a window into investment banking without having to do all the grunt work of investment banking. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting balance as well. But I'll, I know I talked for a long time, so I'll stop there. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. So there are there are some um, things. I'll, I'll maybe I'll try and summarize a little bit. J James was actually asking about private companies, but I'll I'll rephrase it slightly. Um, one of the ways that we talk about valuation is, of course. Uh, multiples, comps and multiples, relative valuation. How do you pick your comps, right? So James's question was really about, you know, pub, private versus public companies. And when you might have, you may have scarce data on some of them, but just pick, how do you pick comps? Well, when, it, when it's a private company, which would be through the IPO process, we look at the public market, right? And the, and the comps that are, that are closest in the public market. And sometimes there aren't any comps, right? They're, they're, you know, we can, you know, I, I can't talk about IPOs we're working on now, but we could be working on a company I'm working on one now that doesn't have any company out there like them. So we'll look then either at what companies have similar growth rates, similar profit margins, um, you know, other aspects of the company. They may not, they may do something different, but they have attributes that are similar. And then we'll use that as a comp set. And we'll often, we can often use two tiers of comps. We can say these are the most direct mm. comps, but you can also look at this broader group of comps, maybe not as directly, but as a secondary measure because they're they're not as directly correlated, but they're still relevant. In terms of the metrics specifically, whether it's EPS or EBITDA or revenue multiple, again, it, that will determine that will be determined by the um, usually the comp set. If we're doing a very fast growing early stage. Um, you know, gaming or software company like App11 or Roblox will tend to look at a revenue multiple, particularly if there's no EBITDA. In those cases, there is, but if there's no EBITDA. Um, and it really is what the, what the comps or metric is for valuation is what we'll use for the new company. Uh, Ian has a really, I think, uh, in-depth, but, but really good question. Going back to sources of information, right? Uh, do you ever rely on an expert to analyze, let's say, highly technical subjects related to innovation, patents, economic analysis, right? To really understand what a business is doing. Certainly, I mean, if you were covering perhaps biotech, that might be something that you absolutely would need to do. Uh, but, you know, do you visit the company, you know, do you, right? So just how, is this simply sitting in front of a Bloomberg terminal and no. downloading things? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, and yes is the answer. We always, again, pre-COVID or even during COVID, we always visit the company when we can because you learn, I think you learn more in person than you do. Um, and frankly, if, if it, COVID didn't exist and you were initiating research on a company, I would feel remiss if we hadn't met them in person because I don't think you've really done your job if you haven't reached out and actually met them in person. So we do visit companies. We could do, if I covered a different sector, like I used to cover printing and publishing, we would do tours of printing presses. God, this was so long ago. You probably wonder what even that is now. But you know, you do go visit the company if there's something to see. You know, I remember when we were working, I was working in the Google IPO, we went and visited the campus because it was important to get a feel of the culture and the company. So yes, you definitely go visit. And yes, you use industry experts. You know, if you're lucky to work for a bank that has the resources or willing to spend it, the first thing we did when Microsoft was buying Activision is we called a lawyer in, in, you know, that we have on a retainer in Washington and asked his opinion on what is the likelihood of the DOJ is going to intercede here. What are the key issues? You know, absolutely go to third party industry experts um, and ask them. We do we hire survey companies, do surveys. Hundred the more the more data points you can get that are independent, the better your research is going to be. Hmm. Alexi has. It's good to see you, Alexi. By the way, um, uh, has has a uh, has a question that is somewhat philosophical, which is where do you sort of see the future of equity research 
going, right? We've seen the financial markets change dramatically and, and for sure the, let's call it the monetization of research uh, has changed sort of dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we now have independent analysts. Where, where do you see the future of, of equity research? Will it still be housed inside large financial institutions? Will it become more, I don't know, democratized, decentralized? Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on when you ask me, you know, I mean, there were times in my in the 25 years that I thought, oh, God, this business is going away. You know, <laughs> you know, there are people, um, investors using index funds more, they're not really doing independent stock buying, commissions have gone down, IPO markets dried up. And then there's years like last year, you know, 2021, where we just did banking deal after banking deal. And, um, you know, there's a lot of volatility in the market. And I just felt, you know, we were needed so much. And I think that the bank rewarded us, you know, for, you know, I mean, it, it, it fluctuates is my answer. I think there's some value to independence, but you have to make the financial model work. And without the banking side and the trading, I don't know if you always have the resources to have the top analysts. I think you'll find that the bigger banks tend to have more of the top analysts because they have the resources to, to put, you know, behind them in terms of different revenue streams, right? Because we get paid both by commission sales and trading and investment banking. So I'm not quite sure charging for research really is a model that is very sustainable. There's some, there, I mean, you're going to hear from one, I don't know. There's some that have really mastered it, but it's harder to make it work because if you already have 30 analysts out there, how many firms are going to pay for one independently versus just, you know, using them for their, after they have their a relationship you know, from trading. So I think it's, it's difficult to be independent. In the last few minutes we have, I'd like to actually ask you, uh, you know, we have a lot of women on the, on the call, and unfortunately, finance is still a very male-dominated, or, or for good or bad, it's a it's a male-dominated industry. You have reached the pinnacle of of a career. You know, um, do you have any advice? I guess for anybody, but but for for young women in general, in, in terms of a part, maybe how to negotiate, how, how to navigate uh, this male-dominated field. I would, I would just say, speak up, you know, and, and, and demand what you deserve. I think it's, I I started in a period where there was a lot of discrimination. I did, when I had a baby, there was no maternity, my first baby, there was no maternity leave. I asked my boss what to do. She said, hide it as long as you can, then take disability. If you need to take more than two weeks off. I mean, I'm telling you, that's the world that I started in. Now it is much more women friendly than, than it ever has been. But the advice I'd give you is show, you know, you show your voice, stand up for what you deserve, you know, speak out. Don't, don't be intimidated because if they think they can intimidate you, they will. So it's a great job for women because there's a lot of flexibility when you get to a senior level. So um, I I think it's a wonderful career for a woman. I would just like to add to that, uh, having hired uh, many people into equity research, Women are terrific communicators. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- as Alexia had in one of her uh, slides, communication of your uh, research is extremely important on the sell side. And um, it is when you, having managed many analysts, when you ask a male what's the best thing about their research, they'll tell you my earnings model. And when you ask a woman about it, she'll say, I just love the customer interaction and all the aspects of knowing the clients and, and bringing my research to them. And that is extremely important. And they, women do it extremely well. Jack Rivkin, who's one of the most famous research directors on Wall Street, went out of his way to hire uh, more women than men just for that reason. Uh, I'm glad you both mentioned that. So just for students of mine or students who are going to be mine, um, when I cold call you in class or I walk to the other end of the room and I say, I'm sorry, can you speak up? Uh, It is done intentionally precisely because we want you to be confident in what it is you are doing. You're all very talented, but if you can't communicate that, you end up working for somebody who can communicate your talent. <laughs> and I don't think that's where you are. <laughs> Alexia and Tom are nodding. Completely uh, true. <laughs> uh, so uh, 
I want totally to thank true. I want to thank uh, you, Alexia, for for kicking off this this inaugural uh, step up seminar series. I want to remind everyone uh, that there is a, another session tomorrow. Uh, it is Tim Nolan from uh, Macquarie, and over the course of the next three weeks, you will have professionals uh, come in who will have different views, right? Whether it's the sell side or the buy side, but also giving you different insights into equity research. 